Hello and welcome to the public launch event for the documentary series, Infodemic, Global Conversations on Science and Misinformation. My name is Aaron Mertz. I had my early career in science research in biophysics. And two years ago, I became the founding director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program, whose mission is to elevate public trust in science and to help foster a more diverse and a more societally engaged scientific workforce. We convene experts and thought leaders in solutions-oriented strategy sessions, mobilize a vocal and diverse constituency of science advocates, and implement significant outreach efforts on behalf of science. I'm excited to host this event with my collaborator, Robin Rosenfeld. Robin and I are the executive producers of this documentary series, and she's also the series writer and director. By way of introduction, she is a filmmaker, and the founder and president of her own production company, Robin Lane Productions, and also vice president of Sovereign Films. She began her career in journalism, producing news segments for the NBC Today Show, as well as documentaries. Among many critically acclaimed projects, her most recent narrative feature film, Effie Gray, was written by Emma Thompson and stars Dakota Fanning and Emma Thompson. She also co-produced the feature-length documentary, The Exiles, directed by Academy Award-winning director, Richard Kaplan. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm so happy to be here and co-moderating this exciting moment and event as we celebrate the launch of this new documentary series, which has been a labor of passion and hard work, all from under lockdown um, during this unprecedented year. So I'm very proud of this project and I think it's quite timely and will continue to be. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to talking and launching. Thank you, Robin. This documentary grew from an effort by the Aspen Institute Science and Society program that started a year and a half ago, months before the COVID pandemic struck the world. In collaboration with the Question of Science Institute in Brazil, we were working to bring together science advocates and communicators from around the world to learn strategies from each other for implementing scientific and analytical thinking into public attitudes and policies, especially on topics that transcend national boundaries like vaccines, climate change, and food biotechnologies. You can see in the back of my apartment, I have this map on the wall and I went through country by country trying to find science advocates and communicators to have a very geographically diverse uh, and well-represented community. And we ended up with a group of 100 science advocates from over 50 countries. We were all set to meet for a four-day conference in March of 2020 in Rome when COVID struck Italy and subsequently the world and we had to postpone the Congress. In the aftermath, I reached out to this global network of experts to gather their lessons about good and bad science communication that were happening in their home countries. We received fascinating stories that we were not hearing in mainstream Western media outlets, such as, for example, in Iran, how mosques were being set up as production sites for PPE, or in Russia, how the Orthodox Church was still allowing and encouraging people to visit churches and kiss the icons on the walls. We were excited to find ways to bring these stories, these lessons, and these voices to broader audiences. So Infodemic was born out of the pandemic and this global Congress that Aaron had organized. And at the time I was heading last March to Rome with a film crew to cover Aaron's global Congress for a feature length documentary I was producing on the disinformation divide in our country. And including science denial. Um, so this all happened when COVID struck Italy. And at that point, scientific misinformation started spreading more rapidly than ever before. And science started becoming further politicized. So for me, infodemic was the only way to describe this phenomenon. Um, I knew that Aaron had worked for over a year to carefully gather this incredible list of experts um, at this community of scientists and science experts from all over the world. And I thought these voices needed to be heard now more than ever. Um, so I approached Aaron and proposed the idea to create a document, a docu-series. 
that would capture this unprecedented time and include these stories that he had started gathering as well as you know interviews that I would do with the experts um, about this time and the lessons that they were learning. Um, so we would also try to capture them in a more, you know, in their more isolated environments based on suddenly we were all in lockdown and this was nothing that we'd ever lived before. So the challenge was to find creative ways to do this with, without a film crew and with limited technical means. Um, so I assembled a small but awesome production team to help navigate these challenges and one and here they are. <laughs> so we started with Patrick Muniz, our editor who started this journey with me, Justin Brown, our editor, and Kevin Brown, who both have science backgrounds. Um, Kevin's actually studying vi virology. He's getting his PhD at Yale. Um, and the awesome Serena Johnson, my assistant, assistant to producer director, who was also a researcher and a filmmaker herself and our talented editor, Robert Potter. Um, so thank you. This is a shout out to the incredible team we had um, to help, you know, they wore many hats. Um, and then of course, Aaron, who shepherded this project from day one and brought the experts to the table, as well as his own intellectual contributions, his scientific knowledge and background as a biophysicist, his love of travel as we virtually crossed the globe and, and, and we shared the mission to create a global dialogue around these topics. Um, so Aaron. Thank you, Robin. And I would like to express our deep thanks to the series underwriters. Infodemic has been supported in part by the Aspen Institute through the Nakazoni Scholarship Fund and the David T. McLaughlin Leadership Fund the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund, the Rita Allen Foundation, and the Question of Science Institute in Brazil. I'd like now to display for our audience the trailer for the documentary. It's about a minute long. Well, infodemic is a correct way of describing the phenomenon we are living in today. It's going to be a problem of the century. When people hear misinformation from people who have an agenda or disinformation, then it's easy if you really don't know what's distinctive about science to start to question it. In just about 48 hours, you can spread misinformation all the way around the world through these channels. There was a law that stated anybody who's spreading the rumor is going to be criminalized. We are fighting against the anti-science attitudes that exist in this country. That's why they want to get rid of us. With regards to science, Brazilian government's response to the pandemic has been the worst possible. There was bad science communication during Typhoon Haiyan. So I think if we don't take proper climate action, in the future we might see climate wars. We can do amazing things when we begin to talk to one another but we have to talk. Thank you, Michael, for showing that. Um, the documentary series will premiere on the satellite network, Link TV, which is available on Dish and DirecTV this coming Sunday, May 2nd and continue the following two Sundays in May. And this coming Sunday, it will also be available on Link TV streaming webpage, linktv.org slash infodemic for web viewers in the United States. And the following day on Monday, it will be available on YouTube for international viewers. We're excited to hold this event today to promote the series and to engage in live discussion with some of the documentary's expert scientists and science communicator subjects. The series features experts from Japan, China, the Philippines, India, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Germany, Italy, France, Brazil, and the United States. Four of those experts are joining us live tonight. And during this event, we have opened up the public chat on YouTube. So we encourage you to submit questions and comments there. And we'll have time at the end to take questions from the audience through this live chat. For our panel discussion, we'd like to bring into um, the screen our experts one at a time. We're gonna start with Dr. Lee McIntyre from the United States. 
He is the author of Post Truth, The Scientific Attitude, and How to Talk to a Science Denier. He is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. And now we'd like to show a clip of Lee from the documentary. When I say that we live in a post-truth era, I don't mean that truth doesn't matter or that nobody cares about truth. What I mean is that truth is under assault by people who have an agenda. I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality, which is when you know that something isn't true, but you wish that it were true. And so you begin to pump out disinformation. So, Lee. Hello. Hello. You've said that post-truth grew out of science denial and that our current political situation in this country right now is because we've had 50 years of unchecked science denial. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that unfortunately what happened is that the tactics that we're seeing right now of disinformation and post-truth and the national and global scale started with the cigarette companies in the 1950s who didn't like the uh, science that was uh, a scientific paper that was just about to come out, which showed that there was an all but causal link between smoking and lung cancer. And they convened a meeting and uh, hired a public relations expert and decided to fight the science. And it worked uh, and it was so successful that they, I think they reached something like a, a sixth of the U US population no internet back then, but they did it through a uh, uh, newspaper and uh, radio and, uh, and uh, TV. And um, they were able to create doubt where there wasn't any. And that was enough. That's all they needed. There's a terrific book by uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway called Merchants of Doubt. And what they call this is the um, uh, really the blueprint for the next 50 or 60 years of science denial. The... Um, if you look at people pushing back against climate change, they followed this same pathway. And I think what happened is this. I think people noticed just how wildly successful this was and said, you know what, if they can deny the truth about cigarettes and cancer, if they can deny the truth about climate change, we can deny the truth about anything at all. We can deny the truth about how many people were at an inauguration, the path of a hurricane, whether the crime rate is going up or down, whether an election was fraudulent, we can use it to deny whatever we want to and use the exact same tactics. So I think that all of that unchecked science denial pr uh, provided a blueprint for what we're now seeing. It's like the problem has metastasized from just denial of science to denial of reality. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, Next, we're gonna bring on Lena Yassin from Sudan. She's a journalist, climate activist, and the Middle East and North Africa program manager for Climate Tracker. Thank you, Lena, for joining us in the middle of the night in Khartoum, especially during Ramadan. It's really great to have you here. We're gonna show a clip of her from the documentary. Sudan has always suffered from serious impacts related to climate change. Last September, Sudan was hit by one of the most massive floods in its history. Sudan is a very poor country, so we don't even have enough resources or even proper infrastructure to deal with the impacts of those floods. And sadly, a lot of people will stay impacted by those floods for several years. Lena, you point out on the Hi. Again, thank you for joining us. Um, so you point out in the series that international media warns people about climate change by making them afraid of it. They, with headlines like we're doomed or the earth is dying, you say that right now, what we need is from the media is to shift from an alarming narrative to a solution driven narrative. Can you talk more about why this fear-based approach is problematic and how a more solution-driven approach can lead to better climate action. 
Yeah, so I personally believe that we are past the point where we want people to be scared of climate change. Uh, we have, the media have done really well at it and might have the, overdone it at some point. Um, people already know about climate change. The level of climate den denialism has decreased a lot over the past few years. Uh, but the problem is um, with this um, very um, scary narrative that the media is um, usually um, le leaning towards, uh, we are creating um, anxiety around climate change. A lot of people are now actively avoiding climate news because it's depressing and because uh, they, they feel like it, there's no way to solve this um, since we're all doomed. So what, what can I do as an individual living on earth? And so even if the, those stories actually have sections where they talk about solutions, people won't be able to read them because people right now are actively avoiding news that makes them anxious. And Right now we are all connected. The internet has made everyone connected and that has made it possible for everyone to know everything around the world. And so the level of anxiety that we can get from bad news has risen. And it's uh, it's very understandable that people right now don't want to um, read depressing news, especially if they think that we they can't do anything about it. And so I feel like right now, what we need to do is, and I'm not, and I don't think this is equivalent to downplaying climate change. What I'm saying is that we need to just change the narrative around climate change because we are past the point where people need to know about it. And now what we need to do is that we need to show people that their individual actions actually matters and that their individual actions are the ones that could lead to policy change. It could lead to scientific breakthrough and it could actually lead to the change that we need in order for, in order for us to all fight climate change. And so this is why I think um, we really need to shift to solution-based journalism rather than um, the scary narrative of climate change is uh, going to kill us all. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Next, we're gonna bring on Dr. Natalia Pasternak from Brazil. She is a microbiologist and founder and president of the Question of Science Institute. She is also the co-chair of the Aspen Global Science Congress I mentioned earlier, which formed the community of experts from which we drew subjects for the documentary. We're gonna show a clip now of Natalia. President Bolsonaro said that the pandemic, it's not a big deal and we should face it like men, not boys. He also said something very bizarre. He said that uh, Brazilians should be studied because they are immune to anything. They can go into the sewers and come out and skate. The public response to the pandemic is much better than the president's. Because we are a very crowded nation, particularly when you take the metropolitan cities. That's why I'm saying we're on a ticking time bomb. We are in for a disaster. That's all I can say. Okay. Natalia, um, you point out in the series, your, your episode focuses on when governments ignore science. And you were paired with our featured expert from India, Narendra Nayak, who we just saw. Um, can you talk about how things are now in Brazil and India with regard to science and the pandemic? We know things have escalated in both places. So, and, and what do you think that India and Brazil can do at this point as well? Well, uh, not much we can do here in Brazil with the present government. I can't say about India, but they are also in a very bad place right now. Both our countries are facing the worst of the pandemic so far. And uh, we share some issues. We are both, uh, huge countries with a great deal of social inequality and lots of people in metropolitan areas. So we have a lot of people crowded together in very tiny spaces living together and it makes it very difficult to fight the pandemic. Uh, in a sense, uh, Brazil is in a worse situation regarding the government because here denialism comes from the president himself and from the Ministry of Health. We already had four ministers so far during the pandemic because the president keeps firing them each time that they disagree with him about the severity of the pandemic, the need for social distancing, the need for mask wearing or the miracle cure 
course that he likes to brand, especially hydroxychloroquine. And his, uh, his most favorite now is called the COVID kit, which is a bunch of medicines, miracle cures all put together. None of them work, but they distribute it locally in every city in Brazil. And it's endorsed by the Federal Board of Medicine and the Ministry of Health. So uh, fighting misinformation, when misinformation comes directly from the federal government is really hard. Uh, you have to fight against people's natural uh, will to uh, where, where they look for information, it's natural for any population to seek for information that you rely on in the institutional channel. So you go to the Ministry of Health website, you go to the institutional government or websites to look for information that you can trust. If you do that now during the pandemic, you will find misinformation. You will find information about miracle cures. Uh, the pandemic is it's just a minor flu. There's no need for social distancing. Lockdowns are going to ruin the economy. And this is how we got to 400,000 people dead. Thank you. Thank you. I wish there were more uplifting news in there, Natalia. Um, joining us from Sao Paulo. Um, we'll talk to you in a little bit. We're going to bring on our, our last subject now um, from the documentary, Dr. Inez Ponce de Leon from the Philippines. She is a writer science communicator and associate professor in the Department of Communication at Ateneo de Manila University. Thank you, Inez, for joining us from Manila so early in the morning. It's great to have you here. We're gonna show a clip now from Inez's portion of the documentary. Science communication was widespread, but the policymakers were not listening. We had no testing. We had no safeguards in place. We have a Philippine president who insists that gasoline can sanitize face masks. He says all of these weird quasi-scientific statements, these bad science communications can do a lot of damage. So, Inez, um, like Natalia, you also experienced disinformation surrounding the pandemic at the national level in the Philippines. And your specialty is risk communication at a more localized level, including during natural disasters. Um, can you discuss how science communication at the community level is so important in both pandemic and a natural disaster? And where do you see the pa parallels between the two? Yes, good morning from Manila. Thank you for having me, Robin and company, and thank you for this documentary. I, I'm looking back at everything I said, and it seems that it just keeps on getting worse here in Manila, so I'm afraid I can't be part of any uplifting news. But I will tell you this, that in my research of both Haiyan and in my observations of what's been going on ever since the pandemic started and ever since we've tried to respond to it, is this. The government really does not function as well as communities do. And this is a parallel I'll draw first between Brazil and the Philippines. It seems that at the community level, we can help each other better than the government is doing. And I think that at the community level, if we start practicing good science communication, perhaps in encouraging people to find out more about how they can help each other, rather than rely on the government. And perhaps we can have a more sustainable solution rather than relying on the government constantly and consistently for aid. And this is especially true now during the pandemic when we're so isolated from each other. The Philippines is now on its, I don't know what number lockdown a year after the pandemic started and our cases are rising rapidly again yet again. I don't even know if we've escaped the first wave. I think we're still in it. But the point being that we have to find a way, ask communities to listen to each other, to help each other out at the local level when our government can't be trusted. The same thing happened during Typhoon Haiyan, locally named Yolanda. People were isolated because of the storm. 
And because of that storm, we realized that we couldn't rely on government alone. We had to help each other. The government calls it resilience. And I think Natalia has a parallel example. People can go into the sewers and come out unscathed. In the Philippines, it's people can go through several floods and typhoons in a year and still go through the same thing year after year. That's not resilience. That's just a lack of compassion. And I think a community level understanding of how people behave and want to communicate and want to help each other and an encouragement of helping each other at the community level is so critical, whether it's a pandemic or a storm. Thank you so much, Ines. Um, I have a quick question though. I'm, I'm curious, do you think, do you attribute the, the current rise still to the national government suppression of information and, and un, un bad measures? It's a combination, I'd say, of bad measures, disinformation, and just allowing people in power to say whatever they want. We recently had a politician who played to and exploited people by saying that he would give away free ivermectin to everybody. And um, ivermectin is a veterinary drug in the Philippines. It's, I believe, part of the COVID kit in Brazil. And it's, uh, it's, I don't know if it's dangerous or not, but it does require some long-term studies the way that all research requires long-term studies. But as a politician decided to distribute it for free because there is a rumor I'd say running around that it could help alleviate the symptoms of COVID. So we have episodes like that where people start playing on people's fears and those people who play on their fears are people in power. We've also come across an audience that decides not to check information beyond the headlines. So it's a really bad, it's a big storm of really of bad things that should not be happening. I don't know if this is the same thing that's occurring across the world, but I've seen parallels in Brazil and I've seen parallels in India to some extent in the misinformation and disinformation in the US. So, you know, it seems that we're one really sad family of misinformation, which makes this series so apt and so appropriate and so timely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Inez. We're gonna bring everybody now, hopefully into gallery view. And I'm gonna ask a question now to the group and I'd love to hear answers from everybody. Um, some of you touched on this, but I'd like to hear more forward looking, optimistic ideas here after some very sobering remarks from many of you. Can you each say what you think some concrete solutions are to combating science denial and putting science in the forefront of people's minds, hearts, and policies. Lee, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, well, I, I just wrote a book called uh, How to Talk to a Science Denier. And I think that one of the ways to get us out of this is to begin to talk to one another again. Uh, a lot of false beliefs that people have about empirical topics are not based on facts. They didn't reason their way into it. It's based on identity. It's based on ideology, politics, something else. And I think that when we talk to one another face to face, we begin to build trust and begin to break down some of those walls. And that will help us to try to pull people out of this. It, you can't ram facts down somebody's throat. That just does not work to convince them. The only thing that really works is to listen, uh, to approach them with patience and respect. It's a very hard thing to do. And I think that one thing to, to remember always when you're trying to do this is most of the people that you're talking to are victims. Uh, the disinformation is created by someone intentionally for their own best interest. And most of the people who believe it are not profiting by it. Uh, they're the victims. And so have some empathy for them when you're speaking to them and trying to convince them to change their mind because they're, they're really not the people who created the disinformation. Lena, what would you say about some concrete solutions? Yeah, so um, I definitely agree with everything that just Lee said. And uh, I also think um, a concrete solution would be to 
be aware of the fact that people are different. There are always different cultural backgrounds and beliefs, and we need to be aware of those when, whenever we're trying to disseminate uh, any sort of information. Even in a country like Sudan, I can never say that I can speak to everyone in Sudan because of how different and how diverse the country is. And so we need to always make sure that any message that we're designing it actually fits with this community that we're targeting and with the audience. And we need to deliver it in a way that fits best with them. So for example, in some places in Sudan, me speaking to a community might not be welcomed at all, while me going to the person that they idolize or they believe uh, and speaking to them might be the, my way in. So just making sure and understanding that there's no one solution that fits all because of how different we are and, and, and how big the world is is our way to actually change, um, to fight this and actually be able to reach people and make sure that they understand the science without having to force it down their throat, like Lee said. Thanks, Lena. Before we go to Natalia, I just wanna remind our viewers that you can submit questions and comments into the live chat on YouTube. Uh, Natalia, after your very bleak picture of the situation <laughs> in Brazil, what are, what are some solutions you would recommend? Well, for Brazil, impeachment might be the only one, but regarding science communication and science literacy, I think focusing especially on science literacy and trying to convey to people that science is a process and that they understand how science is built and, and how uh, it's subject to changing your mind. It's okay to change your mind about your hypotheses and your ideas when you you're facing new evidence if the new evidence is good enough. And, uh, and I think maybe to convey scientific consensus too, because people have the impression sometimes that science is like, it's democratic. So maybe you, uh, there, there is a bunch of scientists who believe that climate change is real and it's man-made, but there's also a bunch of scientists that believe that it's not. And, and I think we have to change this idea and really get to people, get people to understand that science is not something you vote on. Science Science is something that you build using scientific method and you reach scientific consensus. And maybe if we can explain this process to people, they will be more familiarized with how science works and not take it as facts that, that you can have opinions on. You cannot really have opinions on science. You, you can have opinions on how science is made, but you have to understand the process. And also make information available to everyone in a way that they can understand Ended. We are very, as scientists, we, we were taught how to speak to our peers. We are not taught how to speak to the public. And the public is perfectly capable of understanding if we can speak in a way that they do. And this requires some training. So uh, train our scientists how to speak to the public, especially here in Brazil, where uh, speaking outside of the university, outside of your bubble, sometimes is really frowned upon. It's, uh, it's seen as a waste of your time. You should be researching and writing papers and not talking to the public. Uh, so I think maybe changing uh, this mindset here in Brazil would be a good start. Thank you. And Inez, some concrete solutions? Impeachment? I'm just kidding. Sorry. But, um, <laughs> but seriously, I can relate. I, yes, we can both relate. <laughs> um, I'd say that I, I agree with what everyone said. And I especially want to latch on to what uh, Lee said earlier about empathy and listening. And that's something I've long advocated in both my research and practice. The people that we speak to are not they're not our sounding boards, they're not blank slates, they have their own experiences and cultures from which they draw how they understand the world. And like as in the Sudan and as in Brazil, the Philippines is culturally diverse as well. I mean, we have 7,000 plus islands and 100 living languages. So we have so many cultures and so many ways of seeing the world that I can imagine that one way for us to really bring messages home. It's not to think in terms of what facts can I give or how can I dress up the facts because then that would just put us back in the trap of mere dissemination, of mere, you know, relying on information alone. Listen instead, find out where people get their information, find out how they get 
to their conclusions. And perhaps in that act of conversing and in that act of exchanging ideas, we could find a way not so much for middle ground, but for understanding each other. Maybe we'll get to persuade people not to ad adopt bad habits or to adopt bad medication. But in that listening, in that reaching out, maybe we do better than speaking from high up above our ivory towers and acting like a government that's trying to control chess pieces. And I hope it works. Thank you. And Robin, what about from your work uh, in filmmaking on your earlier project on misinformation, the feature length film, and then with this um, short form documentary series, what, what solutions have you come up with? Well, I would say, as our trailer says, as Lisa so succinctly says, we have to talk. That's number one. But as a filmmaker, it's, it's about trying to create bridges of understanding that crosses the political aisle and also the idea of global conversations excites me because I think the, if nothing else, the pandemic has taught us how we need to rely, it's a global pandemic, we need to collaborate on scientific information and, and evidence-based information and have it, it because it can be crucial to our survival. And so I would say trying to continue, I'd like to continue to get these, to examine these conversations, to have these conversations and foment them through our series and through other content. I hope that there's also some media reform where the media continues efforts to separate fact from fiction a little more and um, instead of sensationalism and, and competition. Aaron, what about you? What are solutions from your perspective? Um, I wanna build a little more on what Natalia said about the importance of the process of science. And I, I can point to some wonderful research that showed empirically that people really can change their minds about long held scientific beliefs, even when they conflict with people's politics or religion or other values, when they come to understand the process of science better. And it's not about bombarding them with more facts and more data and more information, but actually conveying what a hypothesis is, how it's tested, what a controlled experiment looks like, what a clinical trial is, how scientists analyze data, peer review, the whole process of scientific publication, as Natalia mentioned. And an example I can give um, from the United States back in March of 2020, the initial guidance here was that masks were not necessary. And the reason that was given is we did not have the scientific data showing that asymptomatic transmission of COVID was possible. And then once that was realized to be the case that people could transmit it even without symptoms, the new scientific guideline and recommendation was wear a mask. To many people, this came across as science being flip-flopping and inconsistent. Scientists don't know what they're talking about, but actually it was science doing what it does best and that's responding to the data at hand. And I think conveying to people that science is this dynamic living process that's continually held up to scrutiny by scientists and then we revise the hypotheses and then the recommendations, I think that would go a long way. A follow-up question that came in in the live chat um, to the one about concrete solutions, how do we get the public's attention to hear the message? I'll let anyone chime in about how we can do that effectively. Lee, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think we've got their attention, but they're confused because they're paying attention not just to the scientists or the science communicators, they're paying attention also to what the politicians and you know other leading cultural figures are saying, and they're saying different things. Um, one, one casualty of recent decades has been respect for um, expertise. And people don't, in this current political environment, like to listen to experts or suppose that experts know any, any better than, uh, than they do. And that can be a real problem. It picks up on something that, that Aaron just said. I think that the way to handle that 
is not for scientists to uh, say, well, we're the experts, you have to listen to us. It's to humanize what scientists do. I think that admitting that scientists can make mistakes, can be uncertain, can change their mind, that's what makes science a living, breathing thing and makes it more credible. If scientists learned how to embrace uncertainty rather than apologizing for it, then I think people wouldn't say, oh, you were lying to us before, or, oh, you didn't know. They would just understand that, as Aaron said, science is a dynamic process where the facts change, and then people test it and they change their mind. I think that's, uh, that's really the best thing to get through. Otherwise, it just looks like scientists have an opinion like everyone else, and they're just another constituency, another interest group. Um, scientists are not an, in an interest group. They're not expressing opinion. They're expressing their views based on solid evidence. Anyone else about how we reach the public. Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to, to join with uh, Lee. I totally agree that uh, we have to talk to the people in a way that they understand and and we have to embrace uncertainty. And, and this is what you were talking about, Erin. Uh, when we explain science as a process, we are embracing uncertainty. We are saying this is what we do. And, and, and science is a process. So we change our minds when we face new evidence. Uh, what happened here in Brazil was quite curious during the pandemic. Scientists uh, we were given a lot of space by the national press and local press. So uh, I I'm on TV every other day speaking about the pandemic, but really explaining science. It's not, I'm not just there to, to say that the president is wrong or the minister of health is wrong. They really asked me to explain scientific concepts. So uh, how does a clinical trial work? What is the phase three of a vaccine? What is efficacy? How do we calculate? How do you know that a vaccine is safe? And we've been given a lot, a lot of space here by the press. It's not just me. Lots of scientists are on TV every day, on radio shows, on the news. And I, I think this, this marriage between scientists and uh, science and journalism really could work. I, I, I may be a little biased myself because I'm married to a journalist, but I think that this can work. <laughs> well, I would just say Aaron, that this is what we're trying to do with our series, Infodemic, is to communicate these ideas to the public and make them more accessible and, and, um, and with a visual medium that actually, you know, engages on many levels beyond just conversation, but also creates experience. And as we travel to different countries through this medium of filmmaking, we can actually, I think that generates empathy and, and a sense of understanding uh, of other. So um, I would say that continuing to try to, to foment conversation and exploration of these topics is, is the way to go. And building on that, another question came in that I'd like to hand over to Lena and Inez. How do you promote science while respecting the beliefs and practices of certain cultures? Lena, I know you do this a lot across the Islamic world and Inez across the very um, culturally diverse archipelago, the Philippines. Lena, maybe you could start. Sure, um, that's, that's definitely a tricky question and, 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 and always a challenge that I face, especially when I'm talking about climate change. Uh, and that's because um, sometimes a lot of people would, um, push back on my arguments uh, with Islamic arguments. So I think what I try to do the best is that I try to do my research and I try to always identify angles uh, that I can back up using the same cultures and belief that my audience um, um, is part of. Uh, so I think my, uh, my way is to always do research to understand my audience, understand what they believe in and understand the arguments that they will probably come up with if they were to read my article. Uh, so yeah, just trying to identify your audience, trying to understand them, and try to see uh, to see the world from their perspective. That's how I usually go around about this. Inez, 
Um, I'd agree with Lena that we do it. I do it the exact same thing. Most of the work that I do right now is in research. So if we have to go to a community, I do have to read up on who that community is, what it believes in. Generally, we are a Catholic country. We're, I think, 83, 85% Catholic. So there is some level of homogeneity in the beliefs, but there are some local beliefs. And the uh, some, some of these you don't find in the literature. You find out when you're on the ground and you're listening to people. So I think one other thing aside from researching is to come into this with still a scientific perspective. And part of that scientific perspective is a willingness to listen and a willingness to ask questions all the time and be curious about the world and be curious about your audience. So yes, um, we do ask questions about what people believe, and when we do get to a community, we have to listen to those um, answers and what they believe, what they think their role is. And eventually, I think that conversation just gets the ball rolling. It helps us establish rapport with people. And eventually, they do start listening. And then they start realizing that science isn't something they learned in school that's bound up in a textbook there to be imprisoned and never to be remembered and to be forgotten completely. It's something that you could do every day. It's a process. It's systematic thinking. And sometimes people discover they actually do it. They do it when they, they cook, when they systematically assess a risk or systematically assess something in their everyday lives. So, you know, if we bring science in as that, as something that is happening close to home in the everyday instead of a school subject that you're quizzed on, tested on with multiple choice questions and true or false questions, then maybe it, science becomes less of a monolith and more of a process and a way of thinking and doing rather than a thing that is one of those talking heads that Lee, Lee talked about, one of those many voices. It becomes something that you do. Thanks, Inez. Um, this question came in, I'd like to direct it to Lee and Natalia. Um, it's about this success of the us versus them in how we address science information. It can be effective. Could you talk about whether that's a, a right a framework for um, dealing with these issues we're talking about, that, that dichotomy, that tension, us versus them, or if there's more of a shared opponent approach that might work? Uh, um, it, it's interesting to contrast that type of view with the view that scientists have about themselves. Scientists are constantly battling with one another, picking apart one another's theories, testing them, arguing, I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, you would think that if there's any us versus them, you know, that's where it exists. But it's not, because what actually I think is the most distinctive thing about science, it was a topic of an earlier book that I wrote, is that they share a common ethos, uh, which I call the scientific attitude. They share this idea that they care about evidence and that they're willing to change their theory based on new evidence. So the thing that really unifies scientists in this thought process that Inez was talking about is that they are willing to give up their beliefs when the evidence requires them to. And that kind of flexibility, that kind of ability to say, you know, I was wrong, but now I understand, is something that I think the rest of us could emulate. Um, when you think about us versus them reasoning, you know, ask yourself, is there any way to settle that dispute? Is there, you know, and I mean, it depends on what it's about. But with science, yes, there is a way to settle the dispute, because you look at the evidence, you run a test, you see what the data say. If it's a political dispute, maybe not, but there's the problem. Science is not politics. So when a scientist disagrees with you or when they disagree with one another, it's not a political or ideological disagreement. It's a disagreement that can be settled based on the evidence. And that I think should be our model. Natalia, any thoughts on us versus them? 
Sure. Uh, I think us versus them could be used to identify uh, a good scientist versus, like Lee said, a bad scientist or someone who engages in pseudoscience because they use this argument, us versus them, a lot. So they are out to get us. They don't want to, they don't want you to find the cure. They don't want you to know the truth about aliens or about the cancer cure or about anything. So the us versus them is usually not not about science. And maybe it makes a, a good tool to recognize what is science-based and what isn't. And uh, you will see a lot of the us versus them speech in pseudoscience, in alternative yeah. medicine, because they're all dogmatic. They are not willing to change their minds before new evidence. So I think it might really help the us versus them speech if we use it as a tool to recognize bad science and pseudoscience. Thank you. Um, as our last all group question, I'd like to ask briefly to each of you, what brings you hope for the future as we're now more than a year into this rather dark period and this pandemic? Inez. Um. Thanks. I, 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 there is a lot of hope, howsoever um, sobering my last account was. If I may just real quickly tell a story. In these last few weeks, government aid for individual communities has dwindled rapidly. We don't know where the money went. But people started, a, a one person started putting up a community pantry. She put out just one little cart of vegetables and food and put on a sign and said, Take according to what you need and give according to what you're able. So this person started a movement that's now spread across across the country. It's not pure charity and handing out the food. It's give what you can for somebody else to use and take what you need for whatever you need you have at that point in time. That gives me hope, not because it's mere giving and exchanging, but it shows that at the community level, we can help each other. We have good ideas. And the government actually responded pretty badly to this. They started calling these people communists. They started tagging them as reds or communists, and they started sending the police out after people. Um, it gives me hope still because people now are starting to question the government. They're starting not just to ask questions, but to ask questions about the government's response. That gives me hope because that's science. It's people asking questions and being curious instead of accepting what the government hands down to them. That gives me hope. Thanks, Inez. Natalia, what brings you hope? Well, I think to see how science responded to the pandemic, how fast we developed vaccines, and how the public is reacting to science. Uh, at least here in Brazil, people are starting to, to really understand a little bit about how science works and how science is important and is essential to their daily lives, how it impacts their daily lives. Suddenly, because of a virus, everyone's lives changed and they see that science is their only hope to go back to normal. So at least science is being valued, even if it's not being completely understood. But I, I think that we can have hope for the future, that people will value science more, they will value uh, investment in science, and they will become more interested. Uh, I mean, uh, the other day I, I talked at the National Evening News about convergent evolution. Uh, I never thought I would use that term. Um, on TV, at, uh, on the national news, I, I actually had to explain what convergent evolution was about. And people were listening and they were sending questions after in my Twitter account. Uh, so uh, there is hope. I think that th this is the good side of it. So science is, uh, for once in history, more popular than football here in Brazil. So I think there is hope. And Lee, how about you? Um. I, I take solace in the fact that scientists are beginning to find their voice 
used to be that scientists just spoke to one another and left it to journalists, science communicators, others who are all doing great work, but they can't speak for science in the way that a scientist can. And there are now programs uh, in the United States and around the world to try to help scientists to communicate with journalists, with the public, to try to let them see what they're doing. And I think that that's important, not only for the sake of conveying accurate information, but it also humanizes scientists. It lets people realize that they're not the other. It's not us versus them. That scientists are trustworthy people who are in this for the right reason and can be trusted when it comes to vaccines or other things. So scientists are waking up to the unique role that they have in speaking on their own behalf. And Lena? Uh, what personally brings me hope is uh, the importance of what I'm doing and the impacts and the positive impacts of what it can have in the future, especially the fact that I'm focusing on climate change. And I know that by raising awareness through um, disseminating scientific information to the public in Sudan, people will start, like, uh, like Anna said, people will start asking questions because people will become aware of the issue. And when the public start asking questions, that's when the policymakers are forced to listen and that's when real change can actually happen. And so I, what brings me hope is that I am hopeful in the, in the positive impact of what I can do in the future. Thank you. And to close this out, Robin, I wanna ask you, can you talk about how this documentary series fits in with your broader mission as a filmmaker and the special role that film and documentaries have in investigating topics like science and misinformation? Well, first as a human being and then as a filmmaker and documentarian, I am a truth seeker. And, you know, as Lee's talked about, there's a growing trend in our culture towards the political subordination of reality, um, to use his words. And, um, that tends to devalue and deny truth, facts, evidence-based knowledge and science. And so to me, documentaries are also about finding truth. And in a docu-series like ours, we can shed light on these topics and show multiple perspectives rather than what often the more sensationalized media does by showing a polarized view, black or white, we are able to look at and hear from multiple voices on these topics of science and, and how to combat science and misinformation. And I think it, it to me, that's part of my mission to, to shed light on these topics, offer multiple perspectives towards finding a truth. I think also film, within film, you're able to hold paradox. You know, you can, two ideas can exist in one place and, and a viewer can hold those ideas and, and contemplate them rather than being forced to determine one is right or wrong or, you know, or, com or juxtaposing combative ideas like often, you know, competing news stations do. Um, and then there's just also that, as I said earlier, just the visual storytelling creates a sense of a multi-sensory experience so that people can engage on a deeper level, maybe not just intellectually, but sometimes emotionally. And hopefully some of this information becomes more accessible and seeps through and uh, helps people raise these questions and you know, provokes curiosity um, in others to continue to have these conversations. So, and, and Aaron, I'd like to ask you a similar question. Can you talk about how this documentary series fits with your broader mission in, within the Science and Society program at the Aspen Institute? Thanks, Robin. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, for both of us, this has been a labor of love and a project that we um, put together completely under lockdown. And for me, it's, it's the convergence of my love and appreciation for the broader world and also for science. And it brings together so many goals of the Science and Society program to spark 
global discussions about the importance of science and to bring voices from underrepresented geographies to big stages like this one and to the satellite network that this will be on and then YouTube um, to promote the wonderful work they're doing. And additionally to create opportunities for individuals and organizations to build connections with each other and collaborations to promote good science and to combat misinformation. The, the Congress I mentioned at the beginning that was gonna be in Italy a year ago, uh, finally took place uh, last month virtually, um, but it was a big success. We had people on there from 20 time zones live. And so it shows that there's um, tremendous need for these conversations. And this documentary is a way of making available to the public a lot of the conversations that we had in that Congress um, behind closed Zoom doors. Um, so I'm just thrilled that this is gonna be out there available to the public. As a reminder, um, please tune in this Sunday on Link TV. It's a satellite network that's carried by DISH and Direct TV. And you can watch it streaming as well on the internet at linktv.org slash infodemic for United States viewers. And then on Monday of this coming week, it will be on the Aspen Institute YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash Aspen Institute. And at this point, I wanna thank all of our panelists and fellow executive producer, Robin, uh, for this outstanding discussion and for your participation in this documentary series. I'm thrilled to put it out there in the world and see what conversations it will spark. Robin, any closing remarks? I would say the same. We're very excited for you to tune in. It's also coming to PBS in July. And, um, you know, we're just, and we're excited to continue the project. So looking forward to, to hearing from all of you and, and hope we will follow us on social media at, at Infodemic Series. And we're excited to have you tune in. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.